Welcome to the UK Travel Planning Podcast. Your host is the founder of the UK Travel Planning website, Tracy Collins. In this podcast, Tracy shares destination guides, travel tips, and itinerary ideas, as well as interviews with a variety of guests who share their knowledge and experience of UK travel to help you plan your perfect UK vacation. Join us as we explore the UK from cosmopolitan cities to quaint villages, from historic castles to beautiful islands, and from the picturesque countryside to seaside towns. Hi, and welcome to episode 49 of the UK Travel Planner Podcast. I'm actually going to start off by saying it's episode 49. I can't believe that myself. And I have got um, Karen again this week to um, chat. We're going to talk about flying this week and tips for flying long haul in particular. Um, So Karen has been on quite a few episodes recently. She has talked to me about my uh, first couple of weeks in the UK for our trip report a few weeks ago. And we did an episode about Harry Potter as well, which was episode, um, so those are episode 45 and 46. Um, And also you can hear Karen in episode 37 talk all about her six week trip back from Australia with her kids and husband last October for six weeks in the UK. So um, Karen has done lots of long haul flights in my life. I've done loads of long haul flights from quite a young age, actually. Um, so I think we're pretty qualified to talk about long haul flights, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for having me again. Yes, and just to add, we've I've done lots of long haul flights and traveling with little kids yes, as well in yes. time, which is a whole extra dimension to the fun of flying long haul. Absolutely. So Karen has three children. I only have one. Mine, mine's kind of now. She's she's twenty seven now. I can't believe that. So, but I used to travel with her a lot when she was younger. Um, from Europe to Africa. So she she's done that kind of long haul stuff. But uh, without further ado, I, I just want Karen to introduce yourself again in case people haven't listened to or heard those other episodes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen. Um, I run a website called Smart Steps to Australia, where I help families make the move to Australia. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I'm originally from the UK, just like Tracy. Um, and now we both live close to one another in sunny Queensland. You do. Um, so we obviously both have different uh, trips back to the UK and, and long haul flights planned. And um, yeah, we thought it'd be good fun to have a bit of a chat about flying. And because I know flying long haul really does take more planning and, and more thought process. And there's a lot more involved in it. And it's also more exhausting. But yeah, I'm sure we can club together to share a lot of our flying tips. So I thought we'd start off with, by talking about, so we'll talk about kind of the, the preparing for the flight, the flight itself, and then kind of on arrival, just things kind of to, to help um, with jet lag. Uh, because you really can't avoid it. It's going to happen. So it's just how you kind of deal with it. Um, so I guess um, the first thing that I always do, and I guess, Karen, is what you, the first thing you kind of work out is how, you, how you're going to get to the airport. So you're going to make sure you know what time the flight is, what time you need to check in, and what time you need to get there, and how you're going to get there. And which terminal you're going yes, to as well, especially point. if you're in London and places like that, which have different terminals. And, and Yeah, you just need to make sure you know that information. Absolutely. So the... Packing for a long haul flight is always interesting. So I I actually kind of learned through my job over the last few years where I was traveling around Queensland, um, doing kind of flight, short haul flights here, then everywhere. But I also didn't, once I put my bag, because I was actually really just taking hand luggage on, when I put my bag in the kind of overhead locker bit, I didn't want to have to get up and take stuff out. So what I started doing was making up little bags, so, you know, little packing cubes with various um, different things in. Um, so I have small bags, uh, some with electricals in, so like my, my earphones, I have one book, pen, paper, um, uh, uh, magazines. I'll have another set with uh, have my charger in it, and then I have another set with kind of like the toiletries, toothpaste, moisturizer, lip balm, deodorant. Actually, I'll put some photos of, of the little bags that I use in the show notes. That was a game changer for us, actually, mm. on this recent trip. I've never done that before, and I've seen so many travel bloggers talking about packing cubes being useful. Oh, yes. So I went and bought packing cubes and I ended up realizing just how important they were for our hand luggage. Yeah. Because, I mean, I always end up with a really heavy hand luggage. We always end up taking a lot with us that we want that we yeah. don't want to put in our hold luggage and being able to organize it all into compartments just make life Isn't so, much, so easier? much easier because i've been on flights where i'm like trying to find that one thing and you, you haven't got the room to get everything out of your bag so ideally what you want is a different color packing cube which has got different things in it that you know what's in that and then you just go oh there's the bag out and then you take out what you need and put it back in so there's no mess 
or mm-hmm. no things dropping everywhere. And you can leave the pack that you know you're going to need more often in the front of the, the compartment yes. um, just so that you've got easy access to it through the whole flight rather than needing to go back into your big bag every time you need anything. And I think it's also a good way to kind of stay organised as well because I know uh, talking to people, you know, work on flights, that things get left behind. You know, you arrive at the destination, you want to get off the plane, but if you've got everything in a little bag, you're less likely because you'll just pick up, you'll keep everything in the bag during the flight. It's just say in the in the front pocket of the seat, um, if the seat in front of you, and then you you just pick it out and put it into your bag. So so that works really well. Um, so I know I always take a change of clothes. I take more than one change of clothes actually with me in my hand luggage because um, I actually flew with my daughter to Johannesburg when she was about five. And our luggage didn't arrive. It didn't arrive actually for five days. Um, and we were flying the next morning to Cape Town. So we had nothing. Um, so, I mean, the airline gave us a little bit of money. So I managed to go and get like one change of clothing. Um, and we were really tired as well. When I, so it was, and it was really difficult to find things. So I now take at least two sets of clothes with me. And I, I you know what? I put my favorite things in my hand luggage. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Like if I lose that dress, I will cry. <laughs> so that's what I do as well. And then uh, so just on that subject yeah. quickly, we, we also, when we're packing our hold luggage, we cross pack. So we don't put all of one person's in one bag. Yeah. And then we, we make sure that there's a mix or at least like you say, a packing cube with an outfit for everybody in every pack, yes. in every bag, so that if we lose four of the five suitcases, we've all still got something that we can wear the next day. Yeah, I never think it's a good idea, you know, if you're traveling with a few of you, you can to, it, to just have your stuff in your suitcase. And if, you know, if, you can, if you're packing it together, then just move stuff around so you've got that option. Um, I think once you've lo- you know, you've been parted from your luggage, I mean, we did, we did get reunited with it after about five days in Cape Town, um, but once you've been parted with your luggage, you kind of realise how important it is to kind of think of those things. Um, you know, I mean, everything turned up, as I say, so it was all right. Um, and then, I, you know, I keep things like moisturiser, lip balm, deodorant, my toothbrush and um, toothpaste, just have a travel one in, in a bag as well. Because if you want to go, you know, get up to go the, into the the, um, the bathroom, in the toilet, um, then you can just pick that and everything's, you know, easily mm-hmm. kind of kept in there. And keeping yourself kind of, you know, your face moisturised and lip balm, because obviously it's dehydrate and on flights the important thing for us was that we had a little one of those packing cubes with medication in it so i always find that i get a really bad headaches on flights so paracetamol and ibuprofen and for the kids i take um the soluble paracetamol yeah um just so that they can have some in some water if they don't feel very good um rehydration sachets because um and, and travel sick tablets and yeah. travel wristbands because um, my kids get really travel sick. So that's really helpful just to have a little pack of, of first aid gear and uh, plasters or band-aids as well, just because you never quite know with kids what's going to happen. Um, just having a little sort of medical first aid kind of pack is really helpful. Yeah, that's, that's definitely useful. And also take um, take things to read, things to watch. Um, I mean, I was on a flight a few years ago and uh, and that was from actually from Birmingham to New York. And um the the uh, console with the movie and everything entertainment didn't work. So, you know, you, you do need to have a backup. I mean, they did move me, but, you know, if it had been a full flight, they wouldn't have done. Yes. Um, so I would have been kind of stuck for, I think it was about a seven-hour flight without ent- any entertainment. So always take a book, um, take your iPad, download any shows that you want to watch onto your iPad because, you know, we, we love going to the movies. So quite often we go on a plane and we've watched all of the movies. So like, oh, um, so just, you know, keep, keep, think of things that will keep you occupied for the length of time. And especially, I mean, the long haul flight, you know, it, from Australia back to London, you're talking really 23 hours. It's a long time. It's a long time you're sitting up in a seat as well. So that's always something to think about. And so, just back to the, yeah. back to the travel sick yeah. thing. Um, my daughter gets horrendously travel sick towards the end of flights. Um, we found that we needed to take extra sick bags, with right. extra yeah. vomit bags yeah. because um, they do provide you with one each. Yeah. Um, and we got through that one very quickly. And then we had more and more and more. And then they kind of ran out and ended up kind of giving us bin liners. Oh, no. And so now I try and whenever we all get on flights, we sort of share the sick bags that yeah. we've got. So, and we keep them for, for the next yeah. flights. Just if nobody needs them, then we've got extras just for, for traveling. And that's where the change of clothes comes in really handy as well. Yes. Kids just 
to make sure that we've got something clean to put them in if, if they're not very well. So with the kids, do you um, encourage them to choose different things to put in their own bags so they take their own hand over John? Yeah, we make sure that everyone's got a rucksack so that we're all hands-free when we're walking. It just makes it a lot easier mm. if you've got it on a rucksack um, and everybody will help pack their own bags so that they're all involved in what's in their bag and they know what's in there. And we could well, quite often we'll end up in different parts of the plane because um, my husband works for an airline so yeah. we end up on kind of standby seats and we can get separated so I need to make sure that when we're packing that everybody's got access to everything because we may not all be sitting together yeah. Yeah. Um, so everyone needs to make sure that they've got their own whether it's coloring books or puzzle books or books or iPads or whatever it yeah. is that they're going to want when they're on the plane and that they've all got something to access um, and that they all know where it is in their bags and that they can kind of access it on their own as well. I don't know, because um, I always book seats ahead. Um, I, I'm very particular that I like to sit next to the window. Um, so poor dog, if he's on a flight with me, he's, I don't think he's sat on the window for, for years now, actually. Um, so because I always like the window seat. So I'm very particular about that. I will put extra to sit on a window seat. Um so, but I know that sometimes, you know, you, you can get cha- uh, changed. I was just going to say, on our, on our last flight back, which was from LA to Brisbane, um, there was a few people who'd paid and pre-booked seats, yeah. specific seats that they wanted on the bulkhead by the window, yeah. and they were moved, and they were quite upset about it. But planes, they, they realign who's sitting where in line with, with what they need at the time, yes. and they can't always foresee what's going on. So just... My tip is always just even if you've pre-booked your seats, even if you're sure you know where you're going to be sitting, just be prepared mentally that things might change. Yeah. And especially when you're traveling in a group that you may not always be together, even if it looks like you are up until the moment you board the plane, things can still change at yeah. the last minute. People were getting moved around on that flight literally as we were boarding. Oh, really? Um, so it, it, things do change. One thing I will say, just after my last flight last year, back from I signed back from Singapore to Brisbane, is um, to make sure you sit in the right seat. Um, <laughs> because the woman that I sat next to me insisted that's why she was. In fact, she wanted my seat to start with because she said she had a window seat, and I was like, no, this is definitely mine. This is my boarding card. Um, she then sat next to me, insisted that was her seat, and then somebody actually got on and said, no, that that that's actually my seat. So she kind of was arguing with him, going, no, it isn't. So the she, she said that she couldn't find a boarding card by this point so a bit suspicious anyway so the the hostess came and obviously the, the guy that was sitting next to me had his boarding card so if, eventually actually it transpired she was actually sitting in the middle of the plane which clearly she didn't really want to do so um but I think you know if you can book I always book seats so uh, you know in if you sit down and there are, you are sitting in the seat that you are allocated and that's the one that you're going to be sitting in make sure you keep your boarding card with you and a close in case you need it because <laughs> somebody decides they want your seat and I will say if you're in the air and you're not in the seat you want to be in, you can always ask. It doesn't hurt to ask because when we were flying back, my daughter and I were sitting, we were really lucky to get bulkhead seats. We were just allocated them just before we boarded because we were on standby seats. Yeah. We got these great bulkhead seats and we had seat free next to us. Oh, and we lovely. were very excited. But within about 10 minutes of the flight, um, somebody else got moved into the seat next to us because they were one of the people that had been moved around from one they'd pre-booked and, and they didn't want to be where they'd been moved right. to. So I think you can ask. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. hurt to ask if ever you sort of want a bit of extra space. It's always always a good idea to just ask the question and they might be able to move you to a, a bigger space or, or somewhere where there is a, an empty seat next well, to you. First class would be good. <laughs> <wouldn't it? laughs> That's kind of my dream. Um, so I always wear comfy clothes, warm layers, I take um, a blanket or a pashmina, something to keep you warm. I have never been as cold as I was on my flight in 20 I'm trying to think last time I was over uh, last year actually 2022 flying from Brisbane to Dubai I was freezing, freezing. cold and absolutely why did they make flights so cold freezing I mean literally I had so many layers on and a blanket and I was still really cold so think about that making sure that you've got you know take a pillow or a blanket you know there's plenty of um inflatable pillows that you can take flight socks um where obviously the the ones for to, to help with them um, thrombosis i've got those ones that you pull up that are a bit tighter yeah. as well um but also like my husband like Doug will always wear socks as well to keep his feet warm because his says his feet get really cold um the main thing for us I, I just want leggings and jumpers is you know something comfy you don't you don't need to look amazing you just want to be comfortable and um you know you can always get changed before you land and i used to do that quite a lot when i used to live um in the uk and fly to, to africa i would 
take I would leave in the winter and go into the summer. So I'd have summer clothes and I'd just, just get changed before we landed into my summer clothes. So you can always get changed if you've got stuff. I just layer up and then you mm. can just take the layers off as you need them. But definitely I'd take like a zip up hoodie, an extra jumper, just all the all the layers. Um, and like you say, a pillow or blanket, you do get a blanket on the plane and you do get a pillow, but not everyone wants to use the plane. Pillows yeah, and blankets. yeah. And my kids love the little neck pillow things. I find them a bit cumbersome to carry yeah. around with you but um yeah just just taking layers and, and you want to be as warm and comfortable as you can be there's nothing worse than being cold on a long flight no no and then trying to get to sleep which I guess is what I'm going to talk about next is if you can sleep really try to to get some sleep that is my always my aim when I get on especially obviously night flights so one of the tips I'll have I was reading about um was to set the time to the time zone you're going to and try to sleep at those times. I can't do that. No, I have I to say, I just can't. Um, you know, getting onto a, a night flight, a 13-hour night flight, um, and, you know, being aware that in the UK it's 10 hours before, so it's during the day. I, I would have to sleep. There's no way I could stay awake. Um, so that's lovely if you can do that, but I, I just know personally I can't. I think it is important during the flight, though, to do some exercise, walk around, stretch during the flight, um, you know, if you can sleep, just make sure you've done a little bit, maybe exercise before you kind of get yourself settled down and kind of snuggle down to sleep. And for sleeping, I know some people love the foot sling kind of hammock yes, things you yes. can use. And I've not actually used them, but I've got an article on my website about inflatable pillows where I interviewed lots of travel bloggers. Oh, about yeah. yeah. How they've got on with inflatable pillows for their kids so that you can turn the seat into kind of a bit of a bed oh, for okay. small kids. Yeah. And I do wish we'd got those for our kids when they were really young, but we never got round to it. And then by the time I realised that they sounded really good, our kids were too old yeah. and too big for them. But yeah. but they're worth exploring. But you do need to make sure that you can um, use them on the airlines that you are planning on travelling on because there are a variety of different inflatable sort of bed pillow things yeah. that you can use. And different airlines have approved different products. Oh, right. Okay. So don't just assume that just because they're available for sale that you can use them on the airline you want to use them on. Um, check. They might only be available to be used on window seats. You might not be able to use them on an aisle seat because you're obviously blocking people in. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to use those, then have a have a little uh, read about sort of the legalities of using them on your plane because you don't really want to buy it and bring it all the way to a plane mm. to find out that you're not allowed to use it and they don't let you use it. Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, I guess it's because for me, obviously, I travel either with Doug or myself these days, so I don't have to think about kids. So I can just snuggle myself down, have a bit of my lavender spray, which is really good. You know, I've just actually downloaded some sleep apps to try Pizzazz or Pizzizz, which is apparently uh, J.K. Rowling uh, uses, and Calm, which I'm going to try um, to see how, how they work. Um, and something like lavender spray, which I really like, to be honest, it's going to sound, going to sound really funny, but for me, the best way to go to sleep is to listen to a podcast, not mine or my <laughs> friends, I should just hasten to add. But um, yeah, sometimes with podcasts, I, I just find that so it just, I don't know if it's a voice, it just soothes me to sleep. And then I, you know, I've, I've had some podcasts I've been trying to listen to about five times and given up because I just fall asleep every time. And it's not because they're boring, it's just because that makes me go to sleep. <laughs> or put on an audio book. They have audio books on there and they just, it's like 15 hours of audio book. And I start listening to those and it just sends me straight off as well. But yeah, I'm not very good at sleeping on planes. I find that I wake up every five seconds and oh, I really struggle to, I have to get to sleep. settled. I have to see I, I, the thought of you know twenty three hours without sleep. I just you know no, it just doesn't doesn't bode well for me. Now, are you in the camp where you print out everything? Because I am. Like yes. I, I've always printed out every booking information, every like all of the information about the trip. So my whole trip's always planned out on a spreadsheet of some kind. Yes, um, and I've got like Airbnbs, hotel bookings, tour bookings, um, coaches, trains, anything that I've booked. I print it out because you never know when you're going to get Wi-Fi. Yeah, when you're absolutely. To show your phone proof that you've made the booking. Or you lose so, your phone or your phone gets nicked. Or, yes. Yeah. Or, so everything's yeah, yeah. in I have one folder that I keep in the family. I wouldn't trust anyone else yes. with it. <laughs> and it has all of the booking information, all of our visa printouts, and anything yeah. if we're going to a country to stop over where we need a visa or anything like that. Um, and I always carry that with me. So Doug normally does that. If I'm traveling on my own, I, I keep the passport, passports and the paperwork. Um, and sometimes, like, uh, yeah, I have in the past kind of put it, printed it out and kept it that way. I'm starting to try to use a bit more kind of spreadsheets. I use Airtable a lot, and I, I really find that works really well for me. And then you can kind of, sh you know, can share that. 
Um, but yes, I also do like paper copies of things because um, I just think, as you say, you never know when you can't get on Wi-Fi, you can't, you know, your phone doesn't work or and it's something like that. So it is useful and um, and it's always worth checking. Um, I, I mean, you don't need, uh, well, you may need a visa for the UK. I can't say you don't need a visa because you may do. It's just checking that if you need a visa that you've got all your visa um, paperwork um, up to date, check that your passport, um, you know, just make sure you've got all of that sorted mm. before you get on the flight. I'm just kind of thinking, I, you know, I, I went to Singapore. Just it's kind of slightly different, but I again, like a, I didn't prepare. So I went to the airport and didn't realize I actually had to fill in a form, a COVID form for Singapore. And I was like, oh, I should have known this. So just sometimes it's like things can slip through. So it's just, and I know there's um, there are going to be some changes in the UK later on the year that they're bringing in uh, for some countries to have to pay. Um, a bit like going into the States where you've got to pay for a visa. So I'm kind of trying to track that at the moment and the EU or introducing something. So it's just keeping track of those things so you know. Um, so I'm just going to ask you, look, because obviously it's a long time since I travelled with Dominique as a, as a small child on an aeroplane, but, you know, you, you've got twins and you've got um, a younger daughter. So, you know, how do you find, how do you find it when you travel with, with when they were really small? Yeah, well, when they were really small, um, we actually made our first flight over to Australia with them. So um, we'd also done some short haul flights in Europe as well. So we'd kind of had a bit of experience of traveling with with little kids. Um, when it comes to lap babies, having a baby sitting on your lap for the journey, um, with twins, when they were really little, um, under two years old, we found that was challenging because um, you can only usually have one baby on your lap per row because there's only one extra oxygen mask that can pop down if, if oh, oxygen okay. masks are needed. So they can't put you and your partner with a baby each on a lap because there aren't enough oxygen masks right. for the other baby. So we then had to travel um, on the row in front and behind each other, yeah. which just added a bit of extra logistics of, yeah. of who had the nappies in the bags and, and all of that extra stuff that you might need for the kids. If you like, you didn't necessarily know you were definitely going to be sat one row apart from yeah. each other. You could have easily been split up much further apart. Um, so that's something to kind of consider if you've got yeah. m- two babies who are under two, that it's unlikely that you'd be able to sit next to one another with a baby on your lap. Um, When we flew out to Australia, our twins were actually four, so they needed their own seat anyway. But our daughter was um, around two years old, and we were debating whether to book her seat. Because if if they're under two, I believe you can have them as a lap child on your lap. And obviously, it's much cheaper to do that. Um, In my opinion, it's not worth oh, the, the saving of, it, of no. the cost Ugh. we decided we wouldn't rush to fly before she turned two yeah we would just pay for a seat for her yeah. regardless because it was the best decision we ever made she was she was a terrible toddler oh. flying <laughs> she's very headstrong now she's age 10 now but back then she was <laughs> oh, no. she really knew her mind and she hated it and just didn't sit or be where she was supposed to be and even having her own seat was challenging, but right. having her on a lap would have, would have been, been really impossible. Hard. By I would have paid yeah. any fee <laughs> to have her in her own space. So, I when people ask if it's if it's maybe one flight, like a an eight to ten hour flight, I think risk it if mm. you want to for the flight from like Australia to the UK or, or like a long, long, two long, haul. long haul flight. Yeah. I just. Personally, regardless of how long the flight was, I would pay for it. But for like, say, a two or three hour flight, we were okay having yeah. the boys on our laps as toddlers. They were really good. They, they We gave them some milk at takeoff and they just slept through oh, the whole flights. And it was really absolutely mm-hmm. fine. But um, yeah, or, you know your own, own kids mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, our boys were pretty chilled out babies, but our daughter was very <laughs> headstrong and she was not somebody that you wanted on your lap for <laughs> a few hours. So I just think it's not worth the cost saving for doing that. Um, the other thing that I would say um, was to order kids meals when you make booking of your flight. When we moved to Australia and we did that flight and our kids were four, four and two, we weren't told we needed to book mm. kids flights. Um they didn't mention it. And when we got on the plane, we were all getting our food and we were looking around and all these kids were getting all these little kind of cool Happy Meal type yeah. bundles with nuggets and, and crayons and things in it. And our kids 
had like a choice of chicken tikka masala and steak or something. And they were really, they didn't eat anything on the But they were like, no, I want the chicken nuggets, mom. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> um, the other thing that we found was that we were told that we couldn't, so if you're taking a child under two, you're usually allowed to take like a car seat or a buggy with you and you can take your buggy to the gate. Mm-hmm. But our kids were older. So we turned, we decided to travel just as my daughter had just turned two and the boys were four and we had her buggy and it would have been really helpful to have taken that to the gate. Yeah. And we were paying for her seat for her. So we didn't think, and the, when we booked it, we, we were advised we couldn't take the buggy to the gate. So right. we had to wrap the buggy and check it in. Right. But it would have made our lives so much easier if we could have taken it to the gate. And we met other families on the plane who had four-year-olds who'd taken a buggy to the gate. Right. So the information we were given wasn't necessarily accurate. So do your research yeah. because when we then had a wait at Singapore, it would have been really handy to have had the buggy for our daughter just to be able to sleep in yeah, it and push absolutely. around and just be an extra child we didn't have to carry yes. or hold on to because – yeah, we'd two of two. you and three of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely. The boys were runners, so oh, that was no. challenging. Oh, but yeah, dear. so just, yeah. just check things like make sure you double check and treble check whether you need to book kids' meals. And if you do want to take a buggy with you to the gate, check if you can do that, even for older kids. So that's brilliant. So so we've 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 flown, we've arrived, we've we've slept and everything's gone really well on the flight. Um so I think the the jet lag issue comes up and um I, 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 I think I suffer far less than Doug does. He definitely seems to get hit harder by jet lag than I am. Um, I don't know why. Maybe because I sleep on the flights. I don't know. But um, I think you know the biggest tip is to try and stay in the time zone. So if you know whether you're ahead or behind the UK when you arrive, is to really try to slip into that time zone. It's harder, I think, from Australia because we are ahead. So when you arrive, you know, you arrive in the morning. Um, or at lunchtime, it's basically 9 or 10 p.m. in Australia. So by that time, you really want to go to bed. And especially if you've not slept for 23 hours, you really want to go to bed. Um, <laughs> but the good thing about arriving is that you're excited. Yeah, true. Um, I know true. that when we get there, we've got family to see yeah. and friends to see and, and places the to see. The first few hours, it's all adrenaline, see. isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that kind of keeps you going. I find the way back is the hardest. Yeah. That took yeah. us a really long time to recover from yeah. on the way back. But on the way there we did settle into it but we did find that sort of about every for the probably the first three days about three o'clock in the afternoon yes. we'd just crash yeah and you yeah. just have to just yeah. go to bed for yeah. half an hour the kids randomly didn't at all they just were normal they oh just that's amazing got there full of energy yeah carried on as normal i think uh, i think that's it it's like you do you say you arrive and you're like dead excited because you, you know it's a new place and and the rest of it i think i always find that the second day is worse because by that you kind of settled in and you're like and now, now all that travel is starting to catch up. So I kind of advise if you're, you know, whether you're, you're traveling from the States or whether you're traveling from, you know, Australia, however, to consider that second day, you may be more tired to so not to overpack your itinerary. Um, but when you do arrive, you know, a good thing to do is, you know, have, have a warm bath, yeah, have, you know, have a shower, whatever you need to do, just you know, moisturize because you're all going to be dried out from the flight. Um, go and have, have something to eat. Uh, keep yourself awake, keep each other awake, um, go and do something that first day. So with that, I mean, like often we say people are thriving in London, go and do the hop on, hop off bus, go and do, you know, a, a cruise down the Thames, do something where you can sit down, but you'll be still taking in all these new sites. So you'll be excited. So, you know, you're getting like sunlight is really important. Yes. Getting outside in the yeah. fresh air and, and getting sunlight on your body. It just kind of helps your body adapt to the new time zone. Absolutely. And um, one key um, thing to think about, um, is how you're going to get from the airport to your accommodation. So I've got to the point in my life where I like to arrive in the airport and have somebody holding my name up so that I get whisked off to a transfer a car that will take me to my accommodation. Um, Doug's opposite. He likes to get on the public transport and he, he'll happily do that where, you know, and he, can do, he can do that. That's fine. <laughs> That's but, the worst idea for me. Yeah, I like to know that we've yeah. got a plan in place for somebody to pick us up Absolutely. and just drive us where we need to go. Because you're tired. You're yeah. tired, you, especially if you've got the kids. You're tired. You've got your luggage. You don't have your full wits about you because you've just been traveling for 10, 12, 24 hours. So you're kind of more vulnerable than that because it's in, you know, it might be a completely new airport in a completely new country. And you will get, you, you you know, you can get overwhelmed. So, and also just to say, like, yeah. we were traveling with a family of five of us. Mm. We had five suitcases, oh, wow. five hand yes. luggages. Yes. So you've 
got to think how you're going to get a group that big yeah. logistically yeah. from A to B. Yeah. And we were lucky, obviously, we're, we're from the UK. We had two family members kind of came with their cars. Yeah. And we managed to travel across two cars with all of our luggage. It was fine. But if when we moved to Australia and we arrived here, I went online and I was Googling to try and find a taxi that was big enough with a luggage trailer that yeah. could be there meeting us to cope with it all because you didn't really want to split across two taxis and yeah. even that probably wouldn't fit with that much luggage. So I just think, I think, you know, it may be a little bit of added expense at the beginning of your holiday to do it. And I've done this all over the world. I've, I've always, I've organized someone to pick me up. But to me, it just then, I'm less stressed through the flight because I know that somebody's going to meet me at the other side and take me to wherever I need to go. I'm less stressed about finding my way around a new airport or thinking how am I going to pay for this or how am I going to do. You don't have to think any of that. You can just literally get yourself to your accommodation, freshen up, and then kind of go, right, okay, I'm here. Now what? Now, you know, and I just think it's a really good um, start to your holiday. And one other tip, actually, which I will share, and again, it's, it, you know, I guess it's not a budget on this one, but um, if your flight is arriving early in the morning, so you're 6, 7, 8 a.m., and you can't check in to your hotel accommodation till 2 or 3 in the afternoon, you know, you consider booking the night before. Just let the hotel know um, that you, you know, so that when you arrive at that hotel, your room is ready. That is your room. And so you can go in, you can freshen up. Because I, I, just the thought for me now of arriving at 6.30 in the morning at Heathrow and not being able to get my accommodation till 3 in the afternoon <laughs> after a 23-hour flight, not a chance. No way I would want to do that. I don't care. I'd pay that extra amount for that night yes. for that hotel. So if you can do that, it's a really good option. And also, if, even if you don't have the budget to do the extra night, you can go to the hotel and drop your luggage. Yes. And yeah. they'll be happy usually yeah. to store it. Just ask them in advance. Just say, I'm going to be dropping X number of suitcases off. Is that OK? And they'll hold them for you for the day yes. while you do go and offer have breakfast and then come back. Yeah. And if you let them know that you really want to get in your room as soon as, they might be able to bring you at 12. Yes, it's exactly. It becomes available a bit earlier. Yeah. Um, so there are kind of ways around it. Um, just what we, we forgot to mention was um, cash money oh, yes. for when you arrive. Yes. Like um, when you land in the UK, you can go to a cash point or an ATM um, and draw out some cash in case you just need a bit of money for yeah. the trip, for getting around or any of those kind of incidental things. But you generally don't need a lot of cash with you as you travel around the UK. You use your card most of yeah. the time yeah. um, for taxis and things like that. Public transport, you can use your card. Yeah. Um, but it, it can sometimes be helpful to have a little bit Having of Having a little money. bit, yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, I think that's great. I think that's, uh, I think we've just about covered everything that we we were talking about before the episode. We did a little bit of a chat just to prepare ourselves. But I think we've kind of covered everything that we thought about. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, if you want to read our tips and uh, obviously check out Karen's um, guide to inflatable pillows and obviously her tips for traveling with young children on on long haul flights uh, there'll be a link to that article on her website in the show notes um, and also just a, um, a a link to all the different things that we've talked about um or yeah you know, like the apps and um you know where you can buy the things like the foot slings inflatable pillows um you know those sort of things will all be in the show notes for this episode so they'll be at uktravelplanning.com forward slash episode sure 49 a podcast about packing have you i haven't you actually haven't yet no yet. i haven't That's done one about packing list. yeah i think we we maybe we'll have to do that one uh at some point maybe later on in the year we can we'll do that one again together <laughs> i think it'll be good because we've got a lot between the two of us we've got so much experience of yeah you, you know I, I say I've had one child to pack. You've had three to sort out, so it's slightly different ball game. And travelling at different times involves packing different things, doesn't it? It's absolutely. Different seasons. So. Yes, absolutely. So that'll be good. So yeah, I think. But I think for this episode, I think that's a that's a wrap. Um, so I just want to say for myself and Karen. So thanks again, Karen, for coming on the episode and sharing all your extensive knowledge and experience. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. So all that leaves me to say is until next week. Happy UK travel planning. Thank you.